three great speakers in today's uh, second chapter of the webinar series um, that is hosted by RLS Brussels and RLS New York and the those two offices of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung have joined forces with Transform Europe as well as the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, the, the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, the Institute for Policy Studies and the Transnational In Institute. So a lot of organizations are hosting this Thanks to all the partners and organizers for making this talk today possible. And today in the second episode of the series, we will focus on state intervention and public services. We want to discuss what kind of state is needed in order to implement all the necessary social and ecological changes in the post COVID area. In, as in the first chapter uh, last week, we want to develop and discuss the proverbial big picture. We want to develop internationalist visions for Green New Deals that will work for the whole planet. And um, that will also um, uh, provide inspiration for the next chapters to come that will go more into details in the weeks and months to come. The neoliberal era has failed, to prevent, has failed to prevent or solve the many crises we have faced in, in the last 40 years. The latest of these examples is the current coronavirus crisis. In many countries, it is revealing the consequences of the dismantling of the healthcare systems and other crucial public services. As a result, economic actors across the political spectrum are demanding state intervention in the economy, often to save entire sectors from collapsing. Therefore, the current crisis emphasizes the need to rethink the commodification of money sectors, but also the role and shape of public services and public utilities. The concept of a global Green New Deal in a similar way con conveys new ideas regarding the place, role and form of public institutions and public services in the tra ambitious transformations ahead of us. So what kind of state is needed to realize the social and ecological changes of a global red and green New Deal? We have invited to talk about this with us, um, Mike Davis, who is a writer, a political activist, an urban theorist and historian. He's the author of 15 books, including City of Quartz and Planet of Slums. 15 years ago, Mike has also published The Monster at Our Door, The Global Threat of Avian Flu in which he reconstructs the central roles of agribusiness and fast food industries, as well as governments in creating the ecological conditions for the emergence of the avian flu. Since this March, he has also published a number of analysis and interviews on the current COVID-19 pandemic, connecting this health crisis with austerity, inequality and demands for a post-corona period. For example, access to healthcare, a new deal and international solidarity. Maud Barlow is the co-founder and honorary chairperson of the Council of Canadians, the most important progressive think tank, think tank in Canada. She also chairs the board um, of Food and Water Watch uh, and is board member in the International Forum on Globalization and a counselor with World Future Council. In 2008-2009, she served as a senior advisor on water to the President of the United Nations General Assembly and was a leader in the campaign to have water recognized as a human right by the United Nations. Recently, she has published an article on the coronavirus pandemic, arguing that COVID-19 puts the human right to water front and center. Welcome, Maud and uh, Mike, and our third panelist, um, that we are still hoping we will try to get into our discussion is Martin Schirdewan. He is the co-chair of the left group in the European Parliament, the GUE NGL faction. He is a former RLS colleague actually, and has left us to uh, be a member of the European Parliament since the end of 2017. Under his leadership and in anticipation of the European Commission <laughs> release of its uh, European Green Deal, the left group in the parliament has presented a detailed policy plan for a green and social new deal, new deal for Europe at the beginning uh, of December in 2019. The document details 10 policy areas of radical action to tackle the climate emergency. 
in the last couple of weeks. However, Martin has been working a lot on the response of the EU to the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of health systems on the continent, economic and financial crisis response and other topics. We will discuss with the three of them um, in uh, two or three, uh, hopefully three quick rounds. Um, we will start with a couple of uh, personal statements uh, from all of them and then two rounds of inputs on the key questions of today's webinar. We will also have um, time for questions from you, from the audience, so use the Q&A function and finish with an outlook on the next webinars. So we will start now with uh, the first round, the icebreaker round, um, with a question um, to all of you, with the same question to all three speakers, um, which is in what way does the current crisis, the coronavirus crisis, um, impact or change your own political work and your own political thinking? What is maybe the one or two most important things that you felt was different or is different now than let's say two months ago? Um, Maud, why don't you start? Wait, you're muted. Um, so, okay. uh, yes. so keen to talk, I forgot. Yes, now we have you, Maud. Go for All it. Right. First of all, thank you, Wenke. Thank you, Mike. It's lovely to be here with you, and I sure hope Martin um, is able to join us. And thank you, everybody um, out there who's joined. Um, these are very trying times, and it's really important that we find each other and we support each other in, in what we're learning, what we, what we know we need to do. Uh, I would say that, uh, just as a kind of opening thought, that the global water crisis has m impacted the COVID crisis in a very profound and terrible way. Um, people like to say <clears throat> COVID is an equal opportunity virus, it, you know, we're all equal. That's not true. And I read a, <clears throat> a really good an analysis that said, yes, it's true, we're all in the same choppy waters, but we have different boats. And for the two billion people who have to drink contaminated water every day because they don't have clean water or the, the 2.5 billion who don't have access to sanitation, the whole notion of having to wash your hands with hot soap and water and keep your you know, body and your surroundings clean is impossible. And so the, the, the coronavirus has <clears throat> highlighted the water crisis, but I would say the water crisis has highlighted our lack of ability to deal with something that comes along like this COVID crisis that basically says, we, we start off with inequality. You start off with uh, extreme poverty, people living in circumstances where there's no way that they can distance themselves, people who don't have access <clears throat> to food from one day to the next. And then of course, in, in this case, water, and of course, healthcare. And it is not an equal opportunity virus. It's going to come through the portals of, of poverty and injustice. So we're really looking at the issue of water um, and COVID in a, in, a, in a way to say, can COVID be the, um, the catalyst to make us understand that if governments can meet this crisis or at least begin to try to meet this crisis and it needs government and it needs public services and good public servants, can it help us? Can we, can we bring the climate and the, and the water and the food crises up um, on the same level? Thank you. Thank you so much. There was already so many important topics in this first statement. Um, so let's go on um, with Mike. Um, what is your impression? What did change for you in your political thinking, in your political work in the recent weeks? Well, I'm speaking to you from uh, San Diego, California. And if I go outside in my driveway, I can see our sister city of Tijuana, just 11 miles away. My wife is Mexican, and the border is now closed to all but essential workers. So her family, which lives on both sides of the border, is split in half. Tijuana has become the epicenter of COVID outbreak in Mexico. And on this side of the border, the hospitals are gearing up as American citizens who live on the other side of the border uh, come back to San Diego. And it's a kind of worst case scenario. But if there's a single political conclusion that we can already draw from this crisis, 
it's that COVID has awarded victory to borders and walls and wall builders everywhere. Consider, first of all, the World Health Organization. In 2005, the World Health Organization revised its uh, international health regulations. This is a statute to which all the parties, all the states that belong uh, to the WHO agreed with. And in January and February, virtually every country in the world, with very few exceptions, simply ignored those regulations um, and basically ignored the, the World Health Organization, which has been much marginalized, despite the fact that it theoretically is supposed to be the overall coordinator of international responses. The European Union, in, in March, the, uh, Italy uh, invoked the civil protection mechanism of the European Union, and not a single one of its sister countries responded to it. They closed their borders, they prevented the transfer of vital medical materials to, to Italy. The only country that came almost immediately to Italy's aid was China, which within two weeks had a plane on the ground un unloading pallets of medical supplies and medical experts. The United States. The United States has for 15 years had a pandemic uh, response plan. Uh, it's had innumerable studies, simulations, dozens and dozens of warnings, uh, all pointing at exactly the things that have gone wrong. The lack of personal protection uh, supplies, the lack of ventilators, test kits. All this has been gone over in great detail. The Trump administration has, from the beginning of this, abdicated the federal responsibility to aid states, uh, supplying them with supplies from its national stockpile, uh, coordinating response. It's practice what you might call a Darwinian federalism. In other words, the response in Europe is fragmented, in the United States is fragmented uh, internally. So you have to ask, what does this mean for the future of the world economy? Because nationalism seems to triumph everywhere, not only over internationalism, but over the multinational organizations uh, that were once considered to be the future of this brave new world of, of globalization. And it looks now like we might be headed towards something like the 1930s when the world market fragmented a world of autarky of uh, countries uh, turning inward to their own resources, to their own empires of exploitation. And of course, uh, we know what happened in the 1930s as a result of this. Okay, thanks for this very, um, it, look, it sounds a bit bleak, but um, it is a crisis and yeah, the closing of borders has been something very, um, very, um, th something that we felt in Europe very uh, much. And um, I hope that Martin can now join. I see him here at least in the list of panelists. Maybe you can switch on your, yes. Yes, it is already switched on. Hello, everybody. Perfect. I hope that you can hear me. I'm glad that I finally made it. Uh, I had some problems with the connection, but um, obviously they are resolved now. So uh, hello, everybody. And um, to answer your question, Venke, um, well, how does the crisis affect me personally in my in my day-to-day uh, -day life and my political work? Well, um, I guess um, it affects me uh, like many other people. I'm working since two months from home. I'm teleworking. And for me personally, this is less problematic for many others, I guess, because, um, well, I'm, I'm a socialist and um, I earn my money in doing socialist politics, so I don't work alienated. But um, I imagine 
how it must be if you want to leave your work behind at your workplace and then you have to take it with you for weeks and for months and to work from home like um, we are doing it now, like teleworking. So the alienation um, of work is one topic that actually keeps me thinking and uh, the let's say the boundaries becoming the workplace and the place where you should spend some leisure time where you live are becoming very fluid. Uh, this is just an observation. Um, what I do politically, of course, is uh, that my political group in the European Parliament and me, that we are working on the crisis or let's say on the answers that the radical left should give to the crisis and all its economic and social consequences. And um, this is uh, something that we'll discuss later uh, tonight in more detail, but everything circles now in the European debate about the question, how can we answer the economic consequence, consequences? How can we answer um, the, the social consequences? How can the economic recovery happen? How can the social recovery happen? And uh, what about the question of uh, sovereign debt and the increase of sovereign debt? How about the role of the European Central Bank and its monetary policies? Um, how about a huge uh, social recovery plan and investments in public services in the health sector? So, well, there are, of course, very differentiated opinions in the political spectrum in Europe, and we are trying to put forward the answers from a radical left perspective. But let me get back to the alienation, because uh, there is also not only a day-to-day -day alienation to be observed, but also a um, very uh, severe political alienation. We have to be very vigilant about this, because everybody almost all over the world has left his so-called normal life or the day, uh, the life he or she has been used to live. Um, so we left norm normality or the normality we knew behind it. We don't know if he will ever return to it and how that return might look like. And um, some member states in the European Union have passed some legislation, some laws that resemble more of an authoritarian power grab than a political answer to the COVID-19 crisis, to the health crisis. And this is something we have to be very sensitive, we have to be very vigilant about. And um, this is, I'm, I'm completely uh, in line with every measure taken in order to uh, protect the health of the people here in the European Union, but I'm very critical about any political measure taken that restricts fundamental and democratic rights and does this in a long and midterm perspective. And this is also something that we need to discuss. Um, um, but from a, let's say, not, not from the perspective that the Trump administration does it or other authoritarian and right-wing administrations do it, but from the perspective of progressive Democrats. And this is something I just wanted to mention. And then there's something, as you and me, we are both living in Berlin, something that I will uh, always remember about this time is, um, first of all, that there actually is a sense of solidarity and that solidarity became the defining topic of the political debate in Europe and in Germany. And on the other hand, that you and me, we, Menke, we are living in this wonderful city, Berlin, and it's, um, well, a, a huge city. And the emptiness of everything here, of the public um, yeah, places and spaces, this is a very strange observation, but this is something that I will remember, I guess, uh, forever in my life. And what I'm doing politically, I already said, well, we are trying to give the answers a radical left has to give in these times. We want to strengthen social democratic rights and we want to reboost the economy and using this reboost uh, also in order to overcome neoliberal and uh, certain capitalist structures. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Um, so we will dive right into the debate that you guys opened. Um, there's a lot of thoughts already here in the room and we will also try to draw parallels between 
the current corona pandemic and the climate crisis in terms of the inequalities um, between people who are differently affected um, that Maud also mentioned, um, as well as the call for the broad restructuring of economies and uh, societies in response to the corona crisis, but also the climate crisis. These can, questions can serve as a material for our discussion. And I want to give the word again to Mike and ask him, um, I'd like to go, to go a bit on uh, what you just started in this first uh, quick round and talk as a historian, as a researcher, as, a, um, uh, as an activist also about how you see the relationship between neoliberalism, globalization and the pandemic and uh, therefore also the need for um, the structural changes of a Green New Deal. So uh, maybe to make it short, how did we get into this mess? Like what are, what, um, are the structures that uh, brought us to the point where we are now? And say oh, that- I'm sorry, Mike, you were just muted. Do you mind restarting that? Sorry about that. Okay. Let, let me turn your question around slightly. There are four fundamental ways in which global capitalism in all of its forms, not only neoliberalism, but imagined a uh, deglobalized fragmentation of the world economy into individual capitalist blocks. Uh, in all those cases, in all imaginable cases, Global capitalism is a threat to human survival in four fundamental ways. First of all, it doesn't generate jobs or provide income and meaningful social roles to half of humanity. Secondly, it cannot guarantee food security to uh, future generations on this planet. And food security is where climate change and disease very much uh, intersect. Thirdly, it not only can't decarbonize our economies, but it can't uh, carry out the adaptation to climate change. And of course, the extreme results of climate change will be felt uh, most disastrously in the countries which played the least role in generating uh, greenhouse gases in the first place. So we're talking about the need to guarantee uh, migration where that becomes necessary, but actually the need for trillions of dollars to be spent adapting agricultural systems in cities uh, to the world. Places like the Indus River Valley, which is the largest irrigated system on the face uh, of the earth, uh, faces uh, incalculable consequences uh, from the new hydraulic regime that uh, global warming bring about. And in the fourth place, of course, is the inability of the marketplace to translate revolutions in bioscience, biological design, biotechnology into public health for all of us. What's been missing, and I made this point again and again um, in addressing the, the role of the American left in the crisis, uh, uh, is any significant internationalism, at least in the case of, of this country. The United States is in a situation where more than likely the result of this crisis over the next year could be a significant strengthening of the left. A labor upsurge is already uh, in progress. Uh, the opportunities here are very, very great. But the Sanders campaign, the, the new uh, American left, it focused almost entirely on domestic inequality and domestic uh, conditions to a degree that I find very alarming. Uh, we have our own kind of version of America uh, first. Uh, 
and there's an enormous need to, to reawaken uh, the tradition of internationalism in this, in this country. And this means things like the priority of medical aid and equal access to vaccines to the global south, in particular to, to Africa, but also to uh, the world's slums uh, population. The need for uh, a left that makes universal health care, not just domestic policy, but also foreign policy as well. Thank you. Thank you so much also for going already into all the things that we need uh, to get out of this crisis, which will also uh, be the more or less the question that I want to ask to Maud. So how do you see getting, uh, how do you see us getting out of the current crisis? What comes after the uh, current crisis? How do we uh, rebuild societies and economy? And where do we need to go in terms of public services, the commons, and how sh could a global Green New Deal contribute to this? Well, clearly we are all looking at governments now, <clears throat> even the right. And we have, I live in Canada, we have a right-wing government in Ontario and suddenly this premier is acting like one of us, sounding like a person who, who cares and using the power of the tools of the state um, to address this. So I guess all of us are saying if, if we can use the tools of the state, strong public services, not just for the COVID crisis, but beyond, real tr true and deep health care. I mean, in, in many of our countries, it's seniors in, in residences, long-term care residences who are dying because those residences were already privatized and the, the systems were not good for them. So we're reaping the, 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 you know, the, the inevitable outcome of what that would be with any kind of, of crisis like this. So it's understanding the commons, the need for us to take back the commons. I would argue that all of the tenets of globalization, privatization of social services, the deregulation of, uh, of everything, uh, free trade agreements. I mean, our organization was founded way back to stop the Canada-US free trade agreement, which morphed into NAFTA, which became the model for the World Trade Organization, the multilateral agreement on investment and so on and so forth. And we now have over 3,000 uh, uh, investment treaties between countries where corporations can bypass their own government and just sue governments of another country if they don't like their laws. I mean, it's, we've, we've tipped it so much over to the corporate side. The promise of globalization was give all of these decisions over to the market and leave the smallest space for what gov governments do. Crisis like this comes along and we realize that the bankruptcy of that and in a world and in which there are the uh, of the top 100 economies 69 are, are are corporations and only 31 are governments this becomes so clear in in a case like this so the question becomes if this if we can have this kind of concerted um, effort and i know it's not everywhere i understand that but we are seeing governments addressing this can we not address this to the other issues, the foods, food security that Mike talked about, the, the, um, the healthcare crisis that we all know is happening. And in the case of <clears throat> the water issue, which I work on quite a bit, uh, we know that half the population of the world doesn't have a place to wash their hands. Uh, between, I mean, depending on what studies you look at, between a quarter and a half of all of the healthcare facilities in the global south don't have running water. So you start off with that and then you add the COVID crisis and you have a pandemic, a double pandemic for governments, for communities, for the people dying, for people trying to care for them. So in addressing the COVID crisis, we absolutely have to take it a step further. And I'm hoping that what will come from this will be a total renewal of, of our foreign policy. I strongly agree with Mike and I think the whole notion of the third world, the debt of the global south is is crucial. The you know the conditions under which that money was granted to the global south all has to be strongly questioned. I mean, there's so much for us to do. I ha I think there's an opportunity here for us to put that question forward. If governments can do it to prevent immediate deaths, um, and they can feel maybe it could happen to somebody in my family, so I guess we should move. We can we can use those same tools. 
What does it mean to truly care health care for people from birth to death? What does it mean um, in terms of true education so that we're not still having this elite system? What does it mean um, in the case of the, the work that I do, Water for All? And to do this, we're going to have to, on the waterfront, we're going to have to um, ensure water, water, but we're also going to have to stop the, the cutoffs. And if you think that's just in the global south, in one recent year alone in the US, 15 million people had their water cut off because they couldn't afford it, they couldn't afford to pay the bills. In Europe, there are 31 million people without basic sanitation. It's not in the global south, that's in Europe. This is a worldwide problem. And as we, we are destroying the world's water, and I want to I won't get into it too much or you won't get me off, but it's not just climate. The water crisis has its own separate reality. You could end every greenhouse gas emission in the world tomorrow and we would still have a water crisis. We're a planet running out of clean, fresh water. We need to, we need to care for this water. We have to <clears throat> protect and, and, and um, refresh and, and, and renew watersheds and we have to share these water sources um, more justly. If we don't, there's going to be another pandemic and it will again hit um, the world's most vulnerable. Thank you very much, Maud. Yeah, I, I, I agree with a lot what you said that especially that uh, the current crisis makes it very obvious that um, the human right to water is um, is very, very urgent and very uh, needed um, in all regions of the world. So um, I'm very happy to uh, go on in that discussion also to use the tools that we see that um, the crisis response can use. Um, and maybe this is also something that Martin can talk about. Um, focusing on the European Union, so we have talked about the global level at the at this moment with uh, with Mike and Maud, the global perspective. So let's move to the European Union, that is your field of work, which is not only one of the Corona hotspots globally, but also a proponent of austerity politics in the last decades. Austerity is toll on Europe in terms of healthcare, and we've seen we are seeing this in the current crisis, for example, uh, the dismantling of public health care, for example. Um, so maybe you can explore this uh, situation in what way did EU policies lay the ground for the crisis, especially in the countries that were hit hardest in Europe, and how did EU policies influence its handling in the last two months? Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, Mike and Maud for these um, very useful contributions and uh, thank you for this uh, follow-up question. Uh, maybe I can just uh, compliment a bit on um, what Maud just said, uh, referring to poverty in the European Union, because this is, um, let's say, the mirror of uh, the results of um, the policies of um, austerity implemented in the European Union. In Europe or in the European Union, better to say, um, a fifth of the population lives in poverty or is at risk of living in poverty. This is an unbelievable number. I mean, we are talking about you know, one of the richest um, regions in the world, the European Union, but a fifth of the population lives in poverty or at risk of living in poverty. And um, when we have a closer look um, at the crisis and um, uh, at the health crisis. Now, here in Europe, we see that uh, this crisis clearly proves that uh, when we talk about, let's say, public services and frontline workers in the health and care sector, or those who keep the public transport running, or those who go on a day-to-day -day basis to the shops and sell the things everybody needs, like food and water, etc., or those who uh, provide us with um, heating and water and energy, uh, these are actually the people working in the public services that keep the society running. And what we have to keep in mind if we um, talk about public services in the European Union, uh, there might be uh, a difference between the English meaning and let's say the at least um, German meaning if we talk about public services in Europe or in in the German speaking regions, this always implies a social commitment as well and a social dimension. So if I'm talking about public services, I'm also talking about society, not only about uh, uh, service comparable to 
any service that is provided by someone who is self-employed or whatever, but I'm talking about a service that actually um, takes care of the needs of the society. And um, what we could see in the European Union in the last three decades, uh, in fact, is that um, the so-called financial market-driven economy or the neoliberal uh, model, and Maud put it like this, that um, we we tipped it over to the corporations. I think now it's time to somehow take society and economy back and maybe the crisis provides us also with an occasion to take at least some parts of society and um, economy and also democracy back under uh, public control. But if we are talking about the impact of the financial market-driven economy and neoliberal politics and politics of austerity in the European Union. We have to say that public service and also social security systems, and that's, that explains the high number of people living in poverty in the European Union. Also social security systems were put under an enormous, under an enormous political pressure. And what we also saw at the same time as a result of neoliberal policies is uh, redistribution of wealth within the society from one class to the other or to keep it very simple the poor are getting even poorer and the rich are getting even super richer and there has also been a distribution of public wealth from let's say public ownership to private capital and at the same time the sources of public um, or state revenue were under constant political pressure by neoliberal interest groups. And um, there is, for instance, no proper taxation for the digitalized economy, neither in Europe nor in the United States or in Canada. There is, let's say, a um, very long lasting history of uh, decreasing corporate taxation or corporate taxes. There is a long lasting history of tax avoidance schemes using tax havens all over the world in order to not pay your fair share and to not contribute your fair share to the society, etc. And that led to that led to two tendencies. And again to keep it very simple, you can call the one cut and the other one privatization. And these principles or tendencies of cuts in the public services and um, social security systems and the privatizations of public wealth, public property and public services uh, have been reinforced by the macroeconomic framework of the European Union. And just to give you an example, many, let's say, critics of um, the neoliberal macroeconomic framework call it, uh, uh, the European uh, macroeconomic framework call it neoliberal as such or per se. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far, but clearly neoliberalism is enshrined in some parts of the European treaties, and that actually is a problem. Uh, to give you an example, the Stability and Growth Pact. I don't know if you have heard of it um, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, but the so-called Stability and Growth Pact uh, defines criteria that the public debt does... Uh, should not exceed 60% of the GDP of the gross um, uh, domestic product. And uh, it also defines that the annual deficit should not exceed 3% of the GDP. And this means, that, I don't want to go into the details here, but this means that the Commission, the European Commission, interferes with the budgetary planning of the member states. And it means that the European Commission can interfere with the national budgetary autonomy, which leads to a very strange situation where a member state cannot address, let's say, its, its original needs uh, properly. Uh, the Commission can say, well, you have to cut here and you have to privatize there because uh, your public debt exceeds the 60% or your deficit exceeds the 3%. And instead, that a member state can boost its economy through public investments or can invest in public services in order to reorganize them, to improve them, to buy some equipment for the health and care sector, for instance. Or instead of investing in social security systems in order to fight poverty, 
uh, this led to the very strange situation that between 2011 and 2018, the Commission uh, recommended or sent recommendations to member, st member states uh, requesting more than 300 times that the member states should cut or privatize cut public um, uh, expenses and privatize parts of their public services. Meaning uh, the Commission actually demanded that um, the member states should um, change um, their well system of pensions, their social security systems, the, uh, the amount of wages, etc. But always meant to decrease uh, social security systems or weaken social security systems and decrease pensions and wages. And 63 times, and this is what I want you to bear in mind, 63 times the commission has requested member states to cut in the health sector, or cut public spending in the, for the health sector, and privatize parts of it. And what we can see now is a, uh, well, a very, very severe and deadly, actually, health crisis in several member states, especially in, in the south, in Spain and Italy foremost. And those were countries that have already been affected by the consequences of the financial crisis. And those were the countries that had to cut in their public spending, especially for public services, due to the Stability and Growth Pact, which did not allow them to exceed 60% of um, the sovereign debt um, of the GDP. Um, yeah, you understand what I mean. But the thing is here that those countries were forced, or those member states were forced, actually, to decrease the level of public services and to decrease the level of public security, uh, of, of social security. And this is unbelievable, and we can see the results, actually, today, every day, in the hospitals in the south of Europe, especially in the south of Europe, but actually all over Europe. And what we need now is, of course, a complete change of this political cause, we need to overcome austerity. That's that's clear. We need to abandon the stability and growth pact and this nonsense criteria of uh, sixty percent public debt and three percent deficit. Well, this is this yeah actually makes even from a macroeconomic perspective no sense at all. This is clearly just neoliberal ideology, and we need to overcome this. But what we need now, and this is what the crisis provides us with but it depends on our political strength as a left in Europe, is that we need a recovery program for public services. This is urgently needed, that we need to improve, of course, the working and living conditions of the frontline workers, of the employee, employees, of the public services, that we need to invest in public infrastructure, like, for instance, public transport, which brings the people to their workplaces, etc. We need, um, from my perspective, or from the perspective of my political group, we need to exclude public services from the state aid, from the European state aid rules, which actually often those regulations hinder the adjustment of public services according to the needs of society. I mean, in a progressive way, not in, in the meaning of decreasing it further and further and further. No, in, in actually, actually adjusting it to the real need of society. Meaning, if there is a need for more intense unit cares, um, care units, intense care units, then please provide the money for that. Can, this shouldn't be a problem at all. I mean, this should be self-understood for a society to spend enough money for health and care for the health and care sector. So what we need, uh, the, purpose, the purpose of public services is not, not to be, is not to be profitable. This has to be a general understanding the purpose of public service is not to be profitable, but to serve the people and to serve the needs of the society. Their purpose is to provide the society with the necessary when it comes to mobility, to participation, to health and energy, to water supply, to heating, etc. And therefore, actually, to achieve this political objective, we have to be very radical in questioning and fundamental in questioning the principle of the market-driven economy when it comes to public services and we have to actually raise the question of the renationalization of public services and we have to actually push towards 
a change of the European treaties and abandoning stability and growth pact. And um, that's it from my that's, side. I hope it didn't take too long. Thank you. That is <laughs> like the, the, the more or less the, I would say the biggest reform agenda um, in terms of reform of the European institutions um, summarized in uh, like 10 minutes. Wow. <laughs> But um, yeah, it was um, good that you made this really, really big uh, line up to like from where are we now and what, uh, what needs to be reformed about and in the European institutions. And um, because this is going to be the starting point for us in our second round, um, we are also still collecting um, uh, your questions in the question uh, box. Uh, that you can find uh, for the for the question Q and A round. So the second round, before we go into the Q and A, will focus specifically on the state, and um, and as we've seen with what Martin said, but also with uh, um, with Ma with what Maud and um, Mike um, already talked about, we need um, ch uh, radical changes in policies in. Um, in state institutions to get to a Green New Deal and to get into the radical transformations that are necessary to overturn this um, overload of the, of the private sector of neoliberalism and so on. And um, one of the most important uh, factors in that, um, in thinking about these transformations is indeed the state and the question of providing of public services in terms of how do we rebuild the economy and so on. And um, also, uh, how do we rebuild infrastructure, services, mobility, and so on, like Martin also um, mentioned in, uh, in his previous talk. So let's therefore go into detail here a bit more and discuss the role of, sta of the state in crisis and transformation. And um, maybe, um, Mike, you can start uh, this round again and uh, commenting on states worldwide, what can we learn from the failure of the neoliberal state that we are seeing? And um, what is the role of states in the current crisis and um, would it, uh, what would need to be transformed um, and changed in terms of the state, especially also um, having in mind that you, um, that you mentioned internationalism or getting over the nationalisms that we see in the current crisis. Well, when we say the current crisis, I think what we're really talking about is we're saying there's a new epoch of history that's opened up. And uh, we all foresaw this in some way, maybe not consciously in its totality. But for instance, for the last two years, all the business press, or for that matter, the academic economic journals have been talking about is recession and not if recession is coming but when it's coming uh i think we all realize that debt is a global problem that we never really structurally emerged from the 2008 crisis uh, we put band-aids on it and what the coronavirus pandemic has done is simply to accelerate all of these uh, uh, trends. It's detonated the recession and made it incomparably uh, more global and more uh, destructive uh, than we imagined. But I don't really believe there's a way out of this crisis. Uh, I think this new era presents us with the same kinds of uh, challenges of, that existed in the late uh, 1930s with the US unable to pull itself out of depression with the viral spread of fascism uh, across the world with new threats of, of war now we get up in meetings and sometimes at the end of meetings we sing this old song uh say le lut final well people haven't really believed or at least most people who sing this song in the lut final for very 
a long time. But I think we have to recognize that there is no realistic way, at least that we can envision now, that we will leave this crisis or prevent it from deepening and unleashing violence globally on a scale we haven't seen since the middle of the uh, 20th century. It's not just a matter of deglobalization, if you forgive such a ponderous term, it's also a matter of de hegemonization. I can't even pronounce it. Uh, in 2008, recovery was led by the huge stimulus package adopted in China. The China can't do that again. Uh, China spent hundreds of billions on infrastructural investments uh, that allowed it and the company, the countries that supply it and whom it sells, uh, to find their way out of the uh, crisis. This is not going to happen again. The, the, the instability in China, the structural instability, is huge. And the Chinese leadership has recognized this for 10 years. Perhaps the reason the Xi uh, resorts to extreme nationalism uh, because realizing uh, how precarious China's situation. The EU is not going to lead the world economy uh, out of the uh, a crisis, particularly as long as it remains basically a club of bankers, Northern European, Central European bankers. And the United States, of course, uh, has totally abdicated uh, an international role. And even if Biden were elected, as he well may be, in November, we shouldn't pretend that this is going to restore the world uh, to what it was before uh, uh, this January. He's already signed aboard the anti-China uh, club. Let me be clear. I mean, as a revolutionary socialist, opposed to the Chinese state and the dictatorship of uh, uh, the Politburo. But what's happening in the United States is frightening, and it's not just campaign strategy because it's become bipartisan, which is really sowing the seeds of endless conflict of a new Cold War uh, with China. A large part of it is based on lies uh, about Chinese science and Chinese uh, medicine supposedly uh, concealing the outbreak, which isn't true at all. In other words, from the standpoint at least of, of, of Americans, we went to sleep one night, we woke up in the morning, opened the doors, and it was 1933 over again. And there's no simple or clear exit uh, for that. And we the final point is, you know, from an American perspective, the most astonishing thing in recent years hasn't been Trump and the Trump coalition. It's been the unexpected rise of a broad new left in America, uh, which is represented in, in to a large extent by the Sanders campaign, but whose roots are in an upsurge of social struggle and unionism. And this struggle has now taken on a, a broader and in some ways uh, more radical depth. So on one side, we're fighting for what um, are traditionally social democratic or progressive demands like national health care. But on the other hand, it's now possible and indeed it's absolutely necessary to talk about socialist solutions, like, for instance, the privatization, the, the, the public production of, uh, of lifeline drugs and medicines, something Elizabeth Warren's actually written uh, a bill about it. So we're faced with, you know, un tasks that are unparalleled uh, really since the 1930s and, and the struggle against um, fascism and political terrains will change everywhere because the surveillance state and 
the rise of social forces willing to adopt uh, what can only be described as, as neo neo fascist political solutions and uh, you know modes of struggle put us in an entirely different historical epoch than before. And the prime character of it, I believe, is the acceleration of the convergence of all the crises we're talking about. They're all interlinked. And I would say to Maud that I agree with Maud entirely, because the problem with water, and particularly with fecal contaminated water, it is one of the most dangerous disease conditions on earth and we will now see in africa and in global slums how contaminated water becomes a comorbidity with corona uh, virus and uh, ensures uh, uh, basically that there are two pandemics uh, going on one we've seen in the wealthy countries but the one in poor countries may follow different pathways and sanitation is one of the absolutely key cofactors and what could be uh, basically a massacre of people in, 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 in conditions of poor sanitation, poor health. Thank you very much um, for um, like outlining um, also that this is not only um, a corona crisis we're facing, but um, like a multi-layered, much bigger one that we have to deal with when we are talking about uh, socio-ecological transformation or the Green New Deal or um, all the work that we all need to do. And um, maybe, uh, Maud, you can follow up on this one um, and comment from your experience also, as uh, from your experience in advocacy as an activist, working also in the UN, and um, so for you, how does the idea of a Green New Deal connect um, with, um, with the notion of the state and with the question of how do we get out of this crisis? So um, how do also social movements and political actors that, um, that Mike was mentioning maybe get into this? So who are the political actors that are driving this change and how can they influence the state and change it? Well, I want to pick up on something and <clears throat> kind of take it a step from uh, what Mike was talking about around globalization. Is it deglobalization? What does that look like? Because I think that as we see the supply chains breaking around the world, those of us who warned uh, about this notion of, you know, if country A makes all the widgets the best, then they'll make all those widgets and country B makes this widget best. So we all argued, first of all, it's going to be all the it's where the, the labor is cheapest and they, maybe the environmental rules are <clears throat> the weakest and so on. It's not, you know, so how did that, how did country A get to get to that status? But that whole notion, that neoliberal notion of production has failed. And it's very clear it's failed. And so you're getting governments now saying, well, we're going to take some of that back. And I can certainly look at our own government in Canada. We have a, a so-called progressive, but very neoliberal, think Tony Blair, um, government uh, in Canada, um, they've come out swinging with um, social programs and money for, for, for students, for people laid off of work. I mean, there really has been an outpouring of, of, in, of incredible support. I mean, even our left parties are saying, okay, you might tweak this a little bit, but nobody's arguing. And, and our government, this, uh, Justin Trudeau never saw a trade agreement he didn't like. Suddenly he's talking about bringing in new legislation to stop foreign investors coming in and taking over failing Canadian uh, companies because they're failing because, you know, we're, the economy is failing. And that this is new talk. We're getting governments, even sort of right wing provincial governments saying uh, we, we have to be able to have to make our own, uh, at least our own medical supplies, at least our own food production so that we're not dependent on, on this global um, chain, this just global supply chain. So I think what we're, we're going to come out of this and globalization as we have known it is gone. What will it look like? Were we going to move back to a narrow nationalism? I mean, we in Canada fought that first free trade agreement because Ronald Reagan was in power and we didn't want Ronald Reagan's, you know, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan in Canada. We got it anyway, but um, we really fought it in terms of having the right to have our own foreign policy, our own cultural policy, and so on. 
And so I think you, there's sort of a progressive protectionism and then there's a, a narrow nationalist protectionism. And we really need to think about what that's going to be like, how we maintain our international connections, how we, how we, how we continue to, be, to care about the world, the good parts of globalization, um, but, take, but take back the, the modes of production that, that we need more locally. And a lot of us are talking about local production and local food production. And we've been talking about that for 35 years. So this is an opportunity again. I would raise another concern, and that is that there's going to be a lot of talk of austerity. Uh, Martin spoke about this uh, from the European point of view, but there's going to be, you know, after all the spending, governments are going to say, we have no more money and we're going to come up against public-private partnerships, particularly, again, in the water sector, but in healthcare and so on. So what, what we need to say is, it, just like the Second World War, this, you know, my dad fought in it, the same government that didn't have money to feed, clothe, house them or employ people suddenly had all the money it needed for that and more. And those, those people came back and said, we're not going back into the bread lines. This, we demand a social nation state. And I think that can happen again. I don't wanna be the, old, the hopeful one on, on here like that, but I do think hope is a moral imperative and I do think there's an opportunity here. And just the last thing that I wanna say around this on, on water is that, and thank you Mike for recognizing that the sanitation piece of this is just absolutely urgent. I mean, more children die of, of waterborne disease than all forms of violence put together, including uh, war. I mean, it is, the, it is the killer. And it's getting worse as the water supply, the supply of, of clean, accessible water is in decline for reasons that we're polluting and diverting water and damming our rivers to death and over extracting groundwater and taking water from where nature put it and where we should be damn well leaving it and taking it to do whatever we want with it because it's our, for our profit and, and pleasure and so on. We need a, a new relationship with nature. We need a new relationship with water. And one of the hopeful signs here is that we are seeing governments come in and aid, aid agencies and wealthy governments directing aid agencies to really addressing this crisis. I just wrote down um, some countries here, Argentina, Spain, Zambia, many cities in the U.S., something like 90 some cities in the U.S., maybe more, have, uh, have stopped all uh, water cutoffs uh, for lack of, of people being able to pay for the COVID crisis. That has to go beyond. I mean, what we have to say is the water crisis doesn't stop when the COVID crisis comes on. Others have, have put serious money into uh, paying, you know, absorbing the debt when people can't pay their water, electricity bills, and so on. Um, and I really do think that this is a moment when we can say, if we collectively as a human family can, can meet badly as it's done in, in many places, we can meet this COVID crisis, we can meet the envir its environmental twin. And none of that can be answered if we don't deal with the deep inequality between nations and within nations within all of our countries. All right, thank you very much. Um, we're going straight into um, picking up some of the questions you all brought into the Q&A. And the first one goes to Martin because he's actually like he would be in line, but uh, I'm switching from my question to your questions so that um, I'm not the only one here asking questions. So practically, um, uh, we wanted to talk a bit about the Green New Deal um, uh, proposal that also the, um, the left faction in the European Parliament, your faction, pro uh, proposed in December already um, as, a, as an alternative to the, to the Green Deal by the Commission. And uh, there's actually a question that uh, relates to that, to the Green New Deal for Europe. Um, so the question is, do you support the call for a care income for people now doing care work unpaid in our families and communities as proposed in the Green New Deal for Europe? I suggest, uh, I suppose it's um, the question means the Green Deal by the Commission, um, but maybe you can use that to um, uh, also explain to us the position of the GUE and um, of the green, uh, green and Left faction and, um, and answer the question. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. My mic is already unmuted, I hope. Yeah, all right. Uh, so thank you very much um, for this uh, question. Maybe I can 
uh, answer it by first of all pointing out a problem of uh, semantics that um, exists between um, anglophone countries and um, let's say the European notion of a Green New Deal. Um, in, as far as I understand in um, English speaking countries, the Green New Deal is a very, has a very progressive ring to it. It is, has been put forward by progressives um, as an alternative to existing also neoliberal or now capitalist authoritarian uh, systems as a part of a uh, transition of society and economy. Um, and in Europe, it is a bit different because the European Commission, for instance, has been putting forward um, their proposals and their idea for um, a Green New Deal, meaning, um, first of all, the greening of uh, the economy, but also uh, many green parties have been working on that topic for quite some time. Um, and the ambition well, let's say the objective of all these political proposals mainly has been to, recon to reconcile um, economy and uh, environment and climate issues. And this is something that um, we as left, a radical left in, in Europe, have to pick up on, but we also have to, let's say, redefine the meaning of a Green New Deal. And that's why we tend to call it a social and green deal or social and green no deal or however, but we want to add the social dimension to it. That then leads me, of course, uh, to the concrete answer of that question. But what we did in, in the European Parliament um, after the Commission presented its proposal for a green no deal as a left group, uh, we um, presented our ideas, which are, of course, more ambitious and uh, far, um, far reaching um, than um, the ideas presented by the Commission. And uh, we were criticizing the shortcomings of the European debate about a Green Deal. Um, first of all, everything that passes European legislation should be um, a Paris compliant, meaning compliant with the objectives laid out in the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, and this is not the case. So, for instance, the Commission aims at reducing carbon emissions until the end of 2030, um, about 55%, which is clearly not sufficient. Uh, the Paris Agreement speaks of at least 65% of reduction of carbon emissions until uh, 2030. Uh, one member state in the European uh, Union, uh, namely Denmark, has already passed the legislation aiming at 70% of um, carbon emission reduction until the end of 2030. This, of course, aims at um, the 1.5% um, laid out in the Paris uh, uh, Climate Agreement. This is something that we are far more ambitious because we put first here, let's say, climate protection and environmental protection, not the interest of uh, the corporations and economy and uh, the attempt to reconcile uh, economy and uh, climate protection is something of course we have to elaborate on we have to think about but what is clear what has become clear in thinking about climate protection is that we need a profound and thoroughly transition also of the way we produce things we consume things the way of living so every everybody more or less knows that but um, that also means that the concept of reconciliation of economy and greening the economy, uh, reconciliation of economy and uh, climate protection is doomed to fail if you are not ambitious enough, of course. And that means putting into question also, uh, let's say, the, um, the private, um, private property and uh, making use of... Uh, yeah, the means of production in a more, uh, let's say, um, public way. Second thing we were addressing is that there is no fossil fuel uh, phase-out strategy presented by the Commission and uh, also uh, by some of the Green parties. This is uh, a crucial thing because it, if it is missing, the member states can still use, let's say, carbon and gas and to be honest, some of the economies, some of the European economies depend on carbon and depend 
uh, in their production on gas, etc. But still, you need a fossil fuel phase out strategy in order to uh, reach 100% renewables in due time. Let's say in 2040, we should produce everything with 100% uh, renewables. And this is, of course, a huge effort to be made. And it also um, is um, linked with huge efforts in public spending in order to change the mode how we produce energy, first of all. This means that we come to the next question um, of just transition. Just transition means um, that there are defined by the European Commission all over Europe or all over the European Union, at least 108 uh, coal uh, mining areas. And in those mining areas work uh, at least 200,040 miners plus their families, plus small scale business, depending on the income of the miners, plus suppliers of the mines, etc., etc. So this is a huge business factor, of course. And um, therefore, in order to transform those jobs um, located in um, the carbon industry, we need to spend money and also transform their workplaces um, to make them, let's say, um, to make them able to work in jobs that are secure also in the future. Now they are working carbon and they know that uh, in one or two decades they will lose their jobs anyways. But this is something that society has to answer. If we want to get out of carbon, then we have to provide them with some future secure job models. Uh, meaning we are also addressing the question of digitalization, of, that, of automation, of course. Automation, digitalization, change of production or does not only refer to renewable energy, but also to the question of digitalization. And then uh, all this fall together. You have, to be, you have to sum up, Martin. <laughs> yes, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. I'm, 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 I'm summing up this. All, yeah, no, no problem. Thank you, Thank you uh, for giving me that hint. Uh, thought all of this together, this leads us to, uh, let's say this results in a um, profound in a socialist and in a ecological transition of the economy and the society. Because this is actually what we are talking about if we are talking about a social and green new deal. This is our progressive alternative. And of course, then we are also discussing the role of public services in that new society again. And then we are also discussing, let's say, minimum um, income or basic income or um, proper wages for people working in the health and care sector, but also for those who take care uh, privately of their beloved ones at home. Yeah, thank you. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs> and <laughs> thanks a lot. I just have, uh, have to look at the, um, the time and I wanted to give uh, also one or two more questions to um, the other panelists, to Mike and Maud, and correct one of my mistakes that I made that I uh, mixed up the Green Deal by the Commission and the one, the proposal of GoNGL with the uh, Green New Deal for Europe, which is an initiative also um, brought into the debate by DiEM25 and other actors. And um, here in the chat, um, people have been discussing that a lot of what you said, Martin, um, is actually um, something that um, is also uh, taken up and discussed in that proposal. Just to add to that, and there were a lot of questions and also this one I'm seeing in the chat here, uh, pointing towards the international dim dimension, like to go, like going um, beyond Europe again, and this like maybe also a bit limited perspective. And um, so uh, one of the questions is that uh, possibly or very clearly we will uh, have to have reductions of consumption and production in the global north, like in the US and in Europe. And um, otherwise the Green New Deal will um, accelerate ex extractivism and exploitation in the global south. So um, that is one of the, one of the might be dilemmas. And I wanted to um, give this question to Mike and ask them, um, 
how, how you think about this. Do we need to accelerate reductions in terms of production and consumption in the global north, otherwise as part of a Green New Deal? Well, <clears throat> the conservative forces in the United States have always been pretty successful in attacking um, the idea of, in, of environmental policies and reduction of greenhouse gases on the question of jobs. Uh, that all this seems, they argue, uh, to reduce jobs and standard of living uh, <clears throat> of working people. And the environmental movement and the green movement to some extent has indeed been guilty of not linking environmental protection, uh, mitigation of greenhouse gases to increasing employment. Okay, so this is a very, very old debate and the Green New Deal does that whether it's conceived in the terms of a, <clears throat> of a national public works project as it is in the United States or a global platform uh, for progressives and socialists around, uh, around the world. But right now, the, uh, I'm sorry, remind me of your initial question. The question was whether we need to radically reduce consumption okay. Okay. in the global north. Now, we shouldn't think of it in, in, in a quantitative sense. Yes, we over uh, consume, but at the same time, even in the so-called rich north, uh, somewhere between one third and 60% of our populations uh, have very poor qualities of life. Uh, they have immense uh, unmet family and, and social needs. And I think we have to look at it in a different way, that there isn't this contradiction between uh, reducing the human footprint in terms of natural resources and consumption. It's really a debate about the nature of the quality of life. And I think part of the solution lies in the nature of the city itself. Now that we're a majority urban world and that cities are the largest generators of greenhouse gases and uh, other problems. We have to go back to the tradition that existed say roughly from William Morris in the 1880s to Red Vienna uh, in the 1920s of an alternative way of life, an alternative urbanism based on public affluence. In other words, you can see behind me, I have a lot of books, but I'll never own enough books to replace my university library. I might have a swimming pool in back. No, actually I don't. <laughs> but even if everybody in Southern California has, has a swimming pool, it's nothing equal to the magnificent uh, uh, swimming pools I saw the last time I was uh, in, in Germany. In other words, there are a lot of unmet fundamental human needs that can't be met simply through the consumption of manufactured products or uh, uh, consumerized uh, uh, leisure. And cities in themselves, in the most classical sense, by putting private af uh, public affluence ahead of uh, private wealth, are capable of realizing extraordinary economies in terms of, of, of consumption, of unnecessary consumption. So as Maud said earlier, and putting the commons first, it's not only placing uh, public resources and public ownership first, it's also transforming the nature of our needs and what we mean by quality of life. And I think only a socialist society can offer the quality of life that uh, people demand. But I don't think this should be a matter of whether or not um, 
uh, you leave litter on the side of the street. Obviously, that's, uh, <laughs> you know, a bad idea. But we have to attack it on, you know, of course, uh, the institutional and, and structural uh, level. But a final point okay. here. Okay, it, last thought. I could just say, say one more thing. It's, it's simply this, that right now the question in front of us is not so much parliamentary agendas and the platforms of, 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 of parties. This remains important, as of course to the political struggles in parliaments and congresses, but the immediate thing before us is what kind of tactics and strategies address the needs of the people right now as they lost their jobs, they see their savings, their homes uh, uh, at risk, everything that, you know, they've built up over their lives, they stand uh, you know, to lose. So I think the major focus, of course, has to be on struggles uh, in workplaces, within communities, out in the streets, and in the United States, this particularly, I think, will be a labor uh, struggle. May Day here was celebrated in an extraordinary way by hundreds of instances of demonstrations by warehouse workers, food workers, nurses, public health employees, rejecting the idea that uh, it's okay to give billions of dollars in relief to big banks, but to expect that low paid workers should go to work without any kind of personal protection. I mean, there's a oh, stirring, stirrings here as something uh, immense. And we need to look very directly at the emergent class struggles that are occurring across the world. All right, thank you very much. And uh, sorry for cutting you short. Um, I want to give uh, Maud also the opportunity to um, uh, come up with some final thoughts, uh, maybe on the question of, uh, of these international um, relations of the Green New Deal. And also there was one very interesting question in, in the, um, in, in the Q&A box that I was thinking you could maybe um, also um, talk about. It was about governments that uh, at the current situation seem to focus on aid and handouts rather than moving the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, to forgive usurious foreign debt. Um, why do you think that is, that is and how can we get them to um, wake up? Well, <clears throat> I'd like to address, first of all, the question that we were just talking about, the issue around uh, north, consumption in the north versus consumption in the south. I get nervous when we talk about individuals being responsible. You know, you hear this all the time with water. Well, just turn the tap off when you're brushing your teeth or get, you know, do whatever, get low flush toilets or whatever. And that really leaves the system to allow it uh, itself to continue. Um, yes, our individual behavior matters. And, but Martin Luther King said many wonderful things. And one of them is, um, legislation may not change the heart, but it will restrain the heartless. We need good law. We need tax reform. If we want to change people's consumption behavior, we need good universal social programs, public services, and tax reform, including um, dealing with the tax havens where people make money, corporations make money, and don't pay any taxation in, 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 their, in their country of origin. This would go a long way to changing things if we equalized out where are, where the, who has the money. And as Mike says, if we if, you know, put hands, money in the hands of workers, you're going to see a very different situation. And of course, there's consumption in the global south too. We have poverty in the global north. So it's, it's, it, becomes a, it becomes something that um, I, I think is an easy statement, but um, needs realistic legislation behind it. Um, I, and I, 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 in terms of aid, I just, I'm, that's a very big question around, of course, we need to look at the IMF and, and, and the World Bank, and, and that's been a big part of the work that we've done, certainly in the, in the water um, field. But I just want to say, I want to end, because I know our time is up now, with, um, with a positive statement, and that is that the COVID crisis, COVID-19 crisis has revealed other crises, in my opinion, none quite as stark as the nexus between poverty and, and water or poverty, food and water, which are all very related. 
Um, and if governments can act to deal with COVID, they can act to deal act to deal with the rest of it, which means the rest of the world is not just for the people within your own country. We are now clearly um, one people around the world. For one percent of the global GDP, we could we could prov provide sanitation and water for every human being in the, on the planet. We need to change our priorities. We need a new relationship with one another and with nature. And I'm I'm a hopeful that this crisis is going to humble us, is going to make people to back to the consumer question, of what do you need? Do you need all that stuff? Do you need all those clothes? Do you need all that stuff that delivered to you? I think there's going to be some change that just happens within our societies. And I, I'm in the dark, in the depths of all of this, I have, I think there are rays of hope and this is one of them. Thank you so, ah, thank you so much. Um, also for ending at, uh, at a positive note, and I will maybe pick that up. And um, for me, the interesting, one of the most interesting things uh, of this crisis is that it's very visible what politics, what politics can do um, and what we can also um, demand um, in our struggles in terms of public interventions and so on. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to say thank you to everyone, to um, the wonderful speakers. Um, I'm going home or I'm home, but I'm leaving my laptop now uh, with a lot of new ideas and thoughts. And thank you for that. Thanks to the interpreters uh, for your great work to making everyone um, understand and be part of our talk. Thanks to all the participants who, um, the attendees who shared their thoughts in the chat and uh, supplied great questions. Thanks to the organizers. And I'm also going to hand over now to uh, my colleague, Aaron, who's going to tell you how um, you're going to go on with this conversation, uh, what's the next topics and the next dates for um, continuing our talk on the um, global Green New Deal. And um, I'm going, already going to say bye um, to all of you, especially to all the Nassims here. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for joining. This was really wonderful. As for next steps, I have put on the screen um, our next webinar hosted by our friends at the TNI. Um, it'll be continuing this conversation in a um, internationalist framing for Global Green New Deal next Wednesday, May 13th. Following that, there will be another conversation on May 20th on public goods and public services and a public goods approach. And then on May 21st, we will have a continuation of the series with um, Green New Deal and trade policy and an overview of how those two are interlinked, a very broad spanning one. We will follow up with all of you and thank you all so much for joining us. It was very much appreciated and thank you all for joining us today. <laughs>